You know, parting words like we read in this passage of Scripture in 1 Kings chapter 2 are important and significant. I was thinking about parting words, words that we say at transition, words we typically say at a commencement address, realizing that at a commencement, usually some of the graduates might possibly be paying attention remotely to what is being shared with them, but hopefully they're holding on to it as they swelter in a cap and gown, probably out in the sunshine somewhere. I was looking around for parting words, and I found these, of course, um, parting words that you may know from George Washington's farewell address when he left the presidency. It's a little long, so bear with me. Washington said, it is of infinite moment that you should properly estimate the immense value of your national union to your collective and individual happiness that you should cherish a cordial, habitual, and immovable attachment to it, accustoming yourselves to think and speak of the palladium of your political safety and prosperity, watching for its preservation with jealous anxiety, discountenancing whatever may suggest a suspicion that it can any event be abandoned, and indignantly frowning upon the first dawning of every attempt to alienate any portion of our country from the rest, or to enfeeble the sacred ties which now link together the various parts. It's almost like he wrote it yesterday. Words that ring true for us today. There's other famous parting words, of course, from the great Dr. Seuss. Don't cry because it's over. Smile because it happened. T.S. Eliot said, what we call the beginning is often the end. To make an end is to make a beginning. The end is where we start from. And then from the founder of the Methodist movement, John Wesley, his final words before he died, best of all, God is with us. What a good word to hear. Transitions and changes like those before the graduates and even mirrored today with their parents, let's not forget them, they all face transitions in this season. And so while these rites of passage are exciting and joyful and well they should be, they also trigger within us a a small sense of grief because the way of life as we know it is coming to an end and a new way of life is dawning and beginning to emerge. We need to treasure these moments. Treasure these moments on behalf of others, like on behalf of our graduates, but treasure them in our own lives because there's lots of times when we turn pages and go through transitions, and in those moments, we need to be careful to listen to how God is moving in our midst. Whenever we have a moment of transition, the first and foremost thing that often comes to mind for us is to learn the lessons of the past. Now, learning the lessons of the past takes a variety of different forms. There's a few keys I thought I'd share with you today briefly from this text. In 1 Kings chapter 2, we read about David nearing his death, and he summons his son, Solomon, to his bedside, I suppose, to give him some parting instructions that he needs to hold on to. Solomon will be inheriting the throne from his father, David, and even though he's not David's eldest son, he is his son from his favorite wife, Yes, I said favorite wife. Did you catch that? In the Bible, David has eight different wives, and it says that there were other wives he had that are not named, in addition to some concubines. Just a little about David. Now, David, of course, had his favorite wife, and her name was Bathsheba, and he came by marriage to Bathsheba uh, through adultery and murdering her husband Uriah. Sounds like a cool guy, huh? And then David, in the midst of all that tragedy and all of that pathology he holds on to, he finds a way to love God. He finds a way to be a devoted servant. He finds a way to write many of the Psalms that are contained in the Bible. And so let's just remember every time we pick up the Bible, we're usually reading stories about people with very checkered pasts. And that's the great witness of Scripture, that God moves 
through people, real people, with their difficulties and all. And one of the most important things that David wants to pass on to Solomon in this moment at his dying is the first key about learning from the past. And it is this, learn from the mistakes of others. Learn from the mistakes of others. And that's what David is trying to bring to his own son in that moment. But the, the lesson goes on. In 1 Kings chapter 2, it's part of a larger story of Israel's history that's contained in Joshua, Judges, Ruth, 1 and 2 Samuel, 1 and 2 Kings. That whole story of Israel's history is written from the standpoint of covenant and whether you obey the covenant with God or you disobey the covenant with God. You're blessed or you're cursed. So one of the most important words we read in that entire body of Scripture, including this one, is the short word, if. If. And in this text, it shows up in 1 Kings chapter 2, verse 4. So that the Lord may fulfill his promise, which he spoke regarding me. So David's talking about himself. Saying, if, there's the word, your sons are careful about their way to walk before me in truth with all their heart and all their soul, you shall not be deprived of man to occupy the throne of Israel. See, David is repeating for Solomon what God said to him back in 1 Samuel chapter 7. He wants his son Solomon to know how important that if is. Remember, David wants Solomon to learn from someone else's mistakes. Unfortunately, Solomon would go on to be an imitation of his own father. He would not just have eight wives, he would have hundreds of wives that he would make by marrying other individuals, creating foreign alliances. He had hundreds of concubines on top of that. He was his father's son by a factor of a hundred in that regard. The kingdom expanded to just a, a huge reach and span during Solomon's reign. He built the temple that was in the city of Jerusalem. He brought Israel to its greatest point of wealth and power, but he was a shadow of his father's devotion and fidelity to God. He was a shadow of it. Upon his death, the kingdom of Israel split in half in a civil war. The ten northern tribes separated into a country called Israel. The two southern tribes became a nation unto themselves called Judah. And nothing was the same after Solomon. So by the time Solomon gets to the end of his life, he decides in some ways to deposit some wisdom about he, what he's learned in the ups and downs of his life. And that wisdom is contained in the book of Ecclesiastes. Does anyone here like Ecclesiastes? I hope you do because it's our entire summer series this year. <laughs> Ecclesiastes. We're going to be talking about how to experience a life of joy. And we're going to use Solomon's wisdom to help us learn that. Key number two, learn from your own mistakes. Solomon was charged with learning from someone else's mistakes, his father's, and he was charged with learning from his own mistakes. Now, David tries to warn Solomon. He tries to tell him of the importance of being faithful to God. And unfortunately, Solomon copies the failures of his own father. So while Solomon is wise, he's also foolish as time goes on. The one thing that Solomon doesn't do that I find is interesting is he not only doesn't learn from his father's mistakes, he doesn't really learn from his own mistakes until the very end of life when we read some of his writings in Ecclesiastes. But one of the most important things we have to remember when we learn from the past is we need to learn by making new mistakes. Because reality is, we're human beings, are we not? We're going to make mistakes. We're going to do things wrong. We're, we're going to make errors in judgment. We're going to say the wrong things. We're going to do the wrong things in our life. That's just the reality of being human. But one of the inner commitments we can make is to say, well, I want to learn from other people's mistakes. I want to learn from my own. But at the same time, I want to dedicate myself to at least making new mistakes if I'm going to make them <laughs> instead of repeating the old ones. Now, there's nothing new here, right? I remember riding around in a work truck with my dad when I was about nine years old and he's driving down the freeway and we were, I can't remember what we were talking about when I was just a kid. And my dad leaned over and he said to me, I want you to remember, Craig, that a wise man learns from his mistakes and a wiser man learns from someone else's mistakes. 
This is, everything I've talked about this morning is, is stuff that was imparted to me as a child. And so as we get into these moments where we have these rites of passage, where we have these movements, of course we're going to look back and survey our life and wonder about what we could be thinking about in a different sort of way. But what about the future? We had all of our graduates share what they were going to go do in the future, didn't we? Do you have plans today? Do you have plans for your retirement? Do you have plans for your work? Do you have plans for the relationships in your life? Do you have plans for those things? Perhaps there's a way we might plan differently. You know, sometimes I hear amongst Christian communities that you just let the Holy Spirit lead you and just go wherever it goes, and if you plan, you're getting in the way of the Holy Spirit. I have a hard time holding that because I think there's a stewardship that we're given, a stewardship of our life, of our days, of our moments, of our money, of all those things. And so to not plan is to be negligent. So how do we plan in a way that is grounded? And this is what David is trying to tell his son Solomon on his deathbed. And that is this, is that you must, you must, you must center God in your life. David's parting words for Solomon focus on the future in two ways. He tells him in verses 1 to 4 to be faithful to God. That's number one. And you'll notice we skipped reading verses 5 to 9. Did you happen to notice that? I decided to skip that today because in verses 5 to 9, David gives Solomon the second piece of advice he needs to have, and that is the people that Solomon needs to make sure he murders and rewards in order to keep his throne as the king of Israel. Everybody just shuffled in your seat right then. I could look at y'all and you're like, I don't know. I'm not sure what to think about that. Even in this story, it's sitting there. David tells his son, be faithful to God, follow him all your days. Here are the three people you need to kill. And here are the two people you need to give stuff to to keep them happy. He does tell Solomon in that first part though, to walk in God's ways and you will succeed in all you do and wherever you turn. That's the heart of this book, Samuel and Kings. The problem when we read the rest of that story is few of the kings will do that. The book of 2 Kings ends with the Jewish people going into exile. And in many ways, this history is written in the Bible from Joshua to Kings to explain how exile happens. This is how you end up in exile, by forsaking the faithfulness that you need to have before God, not loving God with everything you have, not keeping Jesus at the very center of life. Doesn't Jesus speak of this himself? One of the very first passages of scripture I remember reading after I got saved and started coming to a church was Matthew chapter 6, 33 and 34. I still have the index card I wrote it down on. Seek first his kingdom and his righteousness and all these things will be added to you. Do not worry about tomorrow for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. Truth In some ways, in that teaching in Matthew's gospel, Jesus is saying the exact same thing that David is trying to tell Solomon in those verses in 1 Kings 2. Seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. You see, instead of of thinking about our future solely as something in our control, we have to think about a future where Jesus is in control, and Jesus is at the center of our lives. And if we make that choice every day, every day to put Jesus at the center of our being and say, all of the plans I have, God, all of the machinations I have of the future, I'm going to place at your feet and allow God to lead from that moment forward. That's faithfulness. And when we're sitting at these rites of passage in our life, some of them are joyous, like graduations, yeah? And other transitions are filled with sorrow death, 
and people around us dying. Jesus has to be the center in all those things. And my prayer for all of our graduates today is that if you would do nothing else, simply do that. Put Jesus at the very center of your life. Every day, say that to Jesus. Jesus, you are the center of my life. Seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. So today I want to close by simply having you take your hands, if you would, just put them in your lap in front of you. And I just want you to envision whatever you got planned, whatever that looks like today, just envision it sitting in your hands. And join me in prayer. Lord, we take these plans that we have, plans we've thought about, plans we've wondered about, plans we've prayed about. Those plans are made out of learning from our past, and they're made out of looking forward to future. And so, God, in our own way, we take those plans that we hold right now, and we place them at the feet of Jesus. Oh Lord, take these plans of ours, use them for your purpose, for your kingdom, and for your glory. Teach us every day, God, to seek first your kingdom and your righteousness, trusting that all these things will be added to us. We lay our lives at your feet now. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 